Very good, Georgia. Thank you very much. Sas F. Aristo Pu Me Calusete. I work at Great Ormond Street Children's Hospital. Uh, um, this is a slide from the opening ceremony of the London Olympics. We got a free advert. It was a very well kept secret. Um, Georgia and Maria and etc. took me to the Acropolis Museum last night and I, although I've worked in London for over 20 years, I, I'm Irish and I brought the Irish weather with me today, so I'm not responsible for the Elgin marbles. So I'm going to talk about bone marrow imaging from an MRI perspective. Bone marrow is made up of three components, bony trabecula, which we don't really see on MRI, myeloid tissue, which is responsible for hematopoiesis, and adipose cells, which increase uh, in a as people, as children and adults age in general. I'm going to focus on T1 weighted and T2 weighted imaging, but the T2 weighted imaging I'm going to refer to is called STIR imaging. It's called, sh for the non-radiologist, it's called, the technical term is short tau inversion recovery images, but that's too much of a mouthful, so I'm just going to talk about STIR imaging being the T2 imaging. If I'm speaking too fast, where is one of my friends, Maria? Can you can tell me I'm speaking too fast? That's okay. So I'm going to, taking my ideas, my paper from these two papers, one in pediatric radiology in 2013 and one from clinical radiology in 2004 and two other papers I'm going to refer to. So normal marrow is generally homogeneous on MRI, but that's a little of an oversimplification. On T1 weighted imaging, marrow signal increases when the percentage fat increases. And marrow signal on T1 weighted imaging is similar on both the 1.5 Tesla magnet and on the newer 3 Tesla MRI scanners. All marrow, as you know, is hemopoietic in the newborn. And normal marrow on T1 weighted imaging is normally iso-intense. It looks the same signal on T1 weighted imaging as muscle. So same as muscle on T1 weighted imaging and if, it, if the marrow has a lot of fat in it, um, so that's fatty marrow, it'll look the same signal as subcutaneous fat on T1 weighted imaging. I'll show you that in a moment. In early infancy, normal hemopoietic marrow has lower signal than muscle, but beyond infancy, normal T1 weighted marrow, T1 marrow has the same signal as muscle. So Marrow converts with age, so hemopoietic marrow becomes fatty over time. That change begins in the extremities and it progresses to the axial skeleton. So, for example, the hands and feet have, normal, have, have fatty marrow in them in a child at one year of age. And the, in a long bone, the change from hemopoietic to fatty marrow begins in the diaphysis, begins in the sh shaft, and progresses to the metaphysis. The epiphyses undergo more rapid conversion, such that if you see a bony epiphysis, for example, the femoral head in its ossifies age six, four to six months of age or so. Well, if, once you see the ossified femoral head at, at four to six months of age, you will have fatty marrow in that femoral head six months later. I'll show you an example soon. <coughs> so the normal pattern is um, of conversion goes from externally to centrally. Um, I should add here that MRI is very sensitive on, to, on T1 to fatty marrow. So what we radiologists see on MRI, the changes in conversion to fatty marrow, we see it earlier than the pathologists. So it's slightly different from gross pathological examination. So here are an example of a five coronal T1 weighted images in um, a three month old, 10 month old, a four year old, eight year old, and 16 year old. And you can see by 10 months that there's fatty marrow in the epiphysis of the 10 month old and in the shaft, four years of age, lots of fatty marrow. And these older children, relatively older children, have lots of fatty marrow. Okay. 
It change, you'll see some changes in the literature, and a little bit of this depends on what on your own MR scanners and how they're set up. But in general, um, after four or five years of age, the metaphysis of the marrow should be, should be fatty in a four-year-old, four and it should stay like that normally. Vertebral bodies convert around the vascular axis, so they get fatty around the central of the vertebra first. The signal, as I said, in the fatty marrow in the peripheral skeletal is the same as subcutaneous fat on T1-weighted images. And you get heterogeneous areas that are such as you get less intense fatty changes in the upper femoral metaphysis and the pelvic bones. And you get normal heterogeneity on T1 and T2 uh, in other places, such as the feet, the vertebrae, and the wrists. So in an adolescent child, if you do an MRI of the foot, you may see a lot of heterogeneous change on T1 and on the STIR T2 images. And that's thought to be due to a combination of persisting red hemopoietic marrow, maybe some growth changes and some micro contusions from trauma or a lot of exercise. Okay, so here is an example. It looks homogeneous, but it's not normal. Okay, so this is a T1-weighted image of a four-year-old child. Don't say that anywhere. This child is four years of age, and the epiphyses should be fatty, and they're not. So this is diffusely abnormal, although it's homogeneous. And equally, the stir, and this is my first example of a stir sequence. So here, there's the T1 for non-radiologists. You see the fatty subcutaneous fat is high signal. On the stir, we've suppress, suppressed the signal, so this is fat, suppressed fat signal, and this signal here in the marrow is diffusely abnormal, but it's very hard to pick up on the stir because you need a little bit of experience on your magnets. So you have to rely more on the T1-weighted imaging, and that's diffusely abnormal. So here's a child that was referred to me, and I'm told this slide is difficult, so I'll try and go through it slowly. This child was thought to have another four-year-old thought to have osteomyelitis. The MRI was reported as normal and sent to me for a second opinion. And I agreed, I didn't see any evidence of osteomyelitis, but I thought the femoral heads are not fatty, the signal of the spine here, I'll come back to that, but they should be more fatty than this in relation to the discs. And I thought, this isn't normal. And I thought this child possibly had leukemia or Gaucher disease or some other infiltration. Um, so we did some T2-weighted imaging on this child, and the T2 images are here and here, and this is a normal example in another child. So this is the, the abnormal child up here, T1, and the T start images down here. And this is diffusely abnormal, it's diffusely high signal, but a bit like the last case I showed you, it's very uniformly high signal, so it's hard to be sure it's abnormal. On our magnet, this is what it, should, what it should look like, so it's probably a little bit too bright, but it's hard to call. So I thought this was going to be a leukemia or Gaucher disease, but actually, to my surprise, it turned out to be metastatic neuroblastoma. And that's unusual because metastatic cancers are usually very heterogeneous, so you get hemorrhagic areas and patchy, high, hyper-intense or bright areas here, so it's unusual to be heterogeneous. But the T1-weighted images was very, were very helpful and made people check the blood film and uh, do a bone marrow aspirate. So to come back uh, to this normal appearance, these are coronal T1-weighted images again, 10-month-old, 4-year-old, and for an 8-year-old. And you can see the epiphyseal ossification occurs early. So in the spine, spine is a little bit confusing initially because in infancy, the end plates are brighter or higher signal on T1 than the vertebral bodies. So the bright things you see here are the end plates. It's curious. Um, whereas on T2, the discs are bright over here. The discs are bright, and so you can tell the discs from the vertebral body. The, on, this is a T2-weighted image because the CSF is bright, but it's not a fat suppressed image because the fat is still bright. So that's not a star. That's just a, a standard T2-weighted image. This is another T1 in a six-month-old, and by six months of age, the vertebral marrow is now brighter than its corresponding disc. Um, the vertebrae have also become a bit more rectangular, so they're easier, it's easier to differentiate the vertebral marrow from the intervertebral disc. By five years of age, the 
vertebral marrow, the vertebral body sh should be hyper intense, that's brighter than the discs in over 90% of children and they typically are brighter around the central basivertebral plexus. And I think you can see there that the marrow is brighter than the disc on that T1 weighted signal. So here's a child with Gaucher disease and it has not been treated. And this vertebral marrow is abnormal, but the child gets enzyme replacement therapy and the vertebral marrow reverts to a more fatty yellow marrow appearance. Another child with Gaucher's disease, age 14, and this marrow is too dark, it's too hypo-intense on T1. With enzyme replacement therapy, it's now gotten a more fatty appearance, and that's more normal. Um, when I started at Great Ormond Street 20 years ago, we used to do sc annual skeletal surveys and I think it was annual MRI scans on all our patients with Gaucher disease because they, some of them used to get silent vertebral collapse like this. They might seem asymptomatic, but their vertebrae were crumbling. But with the advent of enzyme replacement therapy, all our patients get enzyme replacement therapy. It's expensive, but they all do get it. And we never see any of these complications now. So we've stopped doing any sort of uh, surveillance imaging on these children now. So coming on to marrow pathologies, uh, broadly you can classify them as hematological disorders or malignant filtration, in <coughs> infection and ischemia. Going into the hematological disorders in a little more detail, you can get marrow hyperplasia, marrow replacement, depletion or myelofibrosis. Going through those individually, as regards marrow hyperplasia, that's typically, you get that with chronic anemias, hemolytic anemias, or you can get it with granulocyte Connolly stimulating factor, GCSF. So in that situation, in an older child who'd have a lot of yellow marrow, the yellow marrow would reconvert back to a more hemopoietic marrow appearance. In the replacement situation, you've, that's caused, you've got leukemic infiltration, lymphomatous disease, or metastatic disease. <clears throat> there, that just replaces the normal marrow. In the depletion setting, the marrow looks normal. It looks fatty. So you just get, you get a depletion situation in the context of um, aplastic anemia. That's the AA. You get depletion or just widespread fatty marrow with lots of, trans, lots of all organ transplants with autoimmune disease and radiotherapy gives you focal fatty marrow changes that are permanent in the vertebral, in the, in the, anywhere in the marrow but including the vertebra. And then myelofibrosis. If you get fibrosis in the marrow, um, it'll become dark or hypo-intense on both T1 and T2 weighted imaging. But we don't see much, don't see any myelofibrosis really in PDA or in the young children I see anyway. Um, the one setting where we would see dark marrow on T1 and T2 in childhood, in young children in particular, will be in osteopetrosis, where the marrow cavity is really obliterated in that situation. So GCSF is a hemopoietic growth factor. It reduces the complications in children on chemotherapy and allows more intensive chemotherapy, delivered for about 10, for 10 to 14 days after a chemotherapy cycle. And it causes reconversion of fatty marrow to red marrow, but in, a, in various patterns, it may be homogeneous, although it's not usually in my experience. It's more typically, it causes marrow reconversion to, into a diffuse or patchy signal, that you get some low T1 signals and a mild increase on STIR imaging, such as, this is my first example, it's perhaps not the greatest, but the marrow on this child now has a kind of a patchy appearance, and, but after, a few months later, the marrow recomes back to a more normal appearance. That's perhaps not the best example. Here, here's another one. It can simulate metastatic disease. You can see this patchy marrow here is, it's not normal. Um, and these foci may be active on bone scan, if you do bone scans in these patients. The foci may enhance on MRI, and it can sometimes be mildly um, photosensitive on FTG PET imaging. 
So the important thing is that on, in oncology patients is that we radi radiologists need to be aware that when the children are on GCSF, because if the, the marrow can suddenly make a dramatic change from diagnosis, and we may mistakenly say the marrow is, has suddenly become abnormal, this could be progressive disease, whereas it's just marrow change due to GCSF effects. So we need to have good communication with our oncology teams for that reason. ALL, or acute lymphoblastic leukemia, as you know, is the most common childhood malignancy with greatly improved survival over the years. But it does come with a lot of skeletal morbidity, both osteopenia and its side effects, and um, osteonecrosis in a sizable number of patients, of which I'll come back to in a moment. So here, this is a child uh, age two, uh, in whom we said the marrow, the child had a seizure, I think, but we, I don't quite, can't remember why the child had a spine MR, but we said this marrow is abnormal. The marrow here should be brighter than the disc, age two. Um, and that, that's a soft enough sign of this child, but you can see that over here in the T2, it's quite heterogeneous. And it's, uh, it's just not right. So we can't always diagnose leukemia, but we can point to the doctor saying, you know, gosh, you've got to check for uh, some sort of marrow infiltration. And this proved to be acute lymphoblastic leukemia. So diffuse marrow replacement, I'm showing this slide again. T1, fatty changes are evident. Stir, the fat is suppressed. Okay, so this is diffusely abnormal on both these sequences. And I apologize, the next image is poor, but um, it just brings home, the, this is a medical legal case that I would briefly show. So these are four pictures of films from my phone. And um, so this adolescent had knee pain. And um, these, you can see the marrow is abnormal and the epiphyses are abnormal. The epiphyses on both sides of the knee are abnormal. And on the stir, they're a bit bright and it's a bit patchy. And this was called osteomyelitis, and it, it can't be osteomyelitis. I mean, you don't, osteomyelitis doesn't give you epiphyseal changes on both sides of a joint like that, and which was tragic, really, because the child then came back with a paraplegia from vertebral collapse from leukemic infiltration, and there was a real opportunity here to diagnose a marrow disorder and leukemia on the MRI. Here's a, a more simple case, a rheumatology referral. I'm sure the child has some joint effusions, but he has hyper-intense spots in his epiphyses and down through his marrow of his femora. And this was, this was metastatic disease from widespread rhabdomyosarcoma. Meta the marrow may be normal if only if there's less than 20% infiltration by tumor. Um, but here's the more typical appearance of a metastatic rhabdomyosarcoma, where you've got bright vertebra and dark vertebra, and heterogeneous abnormal vertebra on T1. And I want to make one other point about metastatic disease, and that is, at follow-up, metastases can become more conspicuous. And you can also, and we, I had this example this week, you can also have cases such as metastatic neuroblastoma, whereby we the, on MRI, the marrow looks okay, and yet we do an MIBG scan and there's widespread metastatic disease, presumably because there's less than 20% infiltration. Um, and so the marrow is normal at diagnosis, the child gets chemotherapy, and on follow-up, the marrow is diffusely abnormal. Well, in that situation, it's just the disease becoming more conspicuous on the MRI. So again, we have to be careful in assessing the marrow at follow-up. and have a very low threshold for saying it's progressive disease if it's just marrow changes without any other destructive changes or other new mass lesions. So here's a neuroblastoma example. Coronal T2, urine is hyperintense. T2 sequence with a big mass encasing the aorta. Um, vertebral body there is a little hyperintense at diagnosis and then a few weeks later is much more obviously ab abnormal. And that's just increased conspicuity of the abnormal lesion after chemotherapy. It is not progressive disease. Whole body STIR MRI is advocated and it has some use. Um, but a, a, if you're using it for staging cancer, um, you have to add it on to your, probably your usual MRI for stage 
for, for the primary tumour, so it, it takes up a lot of time. Um, there's an article in this month's Paediatric Radiology, a, a meta-analysis about paediatric whole body stir, saying the, it's uncertain how useful it is at the moment. Um, we, used to, we tried whole body stir MRI in neuroblastoma cases. There's a suprarenal mass lesion here and abnormal vertebra. I, yeah, I think there are abnormal vertebra here. It's hard to see it. Yeah, there are abnormal vertebra. Um, we tried it in a few neuroblastoma cases, but we missed metastases at the skull base in two children that were, had very obvious metastatic disease in the skull base on MIBG scanning. And we thought it was just a little bit of sinusitis at the skull base. So we, we don't do much whole body MRI, except in our CRMO cases, of which I'll talk briefly about in a, in a moment. So we don't do a lot of CR whole body stir, but it, it can be useful, there's no doubt about that. Diffusion weighted imaging with body background suppression, so called DWIBs, is popular in adult oncology, but it hasn't really caught on in pediatrics. In this study by former colleagues of mine, uh, they found restricted diffusion was a normal finding in a lot of the pediatric marrow, unlike adult marrow. You got restricted diffusion in normal growth plates, and the growth plates were frequently asymmetric, so it would, it would be very easy to overcall cancer on DWIBs. So with DWIBs, I'm not, again, it does has a limited role in pediatric oncology. Chemical shift imaging has its advocates. It's useful, I won't go into it, but it's useful for assessing marrow replacement. And in the normal marrow, uh, you, if you have water and fat in normal marrow, you'll get signal loss on out of phase images. Chemical shift imaging is in phase and out of phase imaging. Um, there are con conflicting um, reports in these two papers as how useful chemical shift imaging is uh, in practice. So we don't particularly use it. I, I think if you use it a lot, you might get good at it, but we don't find it very useful. Moving on to osteonecrosis. Uh, osteonecrosis causes uh, is very common in the uh, children who have had treatment for ALL. In one study that I'm familiar with, where every child would had ALL treatments was their lower limbs were looked at. 40% developed osteonecrosis somewhere in their lower limbs. Um, it causes geographic abnormalities on both T1 and T2. You get a sclerotic dark line on the outer aspect of the lesion and then areas of inner edema. It's a very geographic, easily identified abnormality. Um, so remember, you see it very easily on both T1 and T2 on stir images. The prevalence of osteonecrosis, I think, is too prevalent in the ALL population for prospective monitoring, for screening them all. It's often asymptomatic until quite advanced. And it is said lesions need to be involving, when they're involving the epiphysis, they have, they have to involve 50% of the articular surface to be symptomatic. The lesion size of these lesions correlates poorly with pain sever severity. It's in the literature that if you've greater than 30% of the surface involvement, you'll have a worse outcome. And some advocate or suggest that up to 80% of these lesions, such as in the hips, will collapse within two years, many needing arthroplasty. That is not our experience, but the, we see only children up to a young adolescent age in our hospital, so uh, maybe it's different elsewhere. Um, Slides, I got this from, an Amer from a friend in America who also tells me they operate on very few of their osteonecrosis cases. But it's interesting, the year 2000, this child had all these lesions uh, around the knee in particular um, and was rel relatively well. Then developed lesions around the elbow and must have had some symptoms to get the imaging, but it didn't go on to any treatment other than physio. And, um, Improved over several years. This is eight years later. The lesions have improved. The child didn't need any treatment. Um, the differential diagnosis for osteonecrosis in these patients is, could it be disease relapse? Could it be metastatic disease? Um, it's usually very geographic and well-defined. In the right population, it's usually easy to diagnose. And you could, but you can get transient, non-specific non signal abnormalities, little mild areas of so-called bone edema here that can be difficult to diagnose what it is, and we would be uncertain here and say you need to repeat this in a few months' time. Here's a child with 
previous treatment with ALL known to be osteopenic has some hip pain and the question is do she, he or she have, she have osteonecrosis and the answer is you don't know. You really need an MRI if you want to find that out. Plain x-rays are poor sensitivity for osteonecrosis. And this is at one German center where there's 630 malignancies. I'll run through this quickly. 630 malignancies. Only nine patients had symptoms that had confirmed MRI. Um, one had a bilateral hip replacement. All others con settled on conservative treatment. So only one, only one needed hip replacement out of 630. So perhaps the conservative approach is the right one. <clears throat> Radiotherapy damages the bone marrow due to multiple factors, due to the dose of the radiotherapy, the field size, the beam and energy, and the age. A young, younger skeleton will get f bigger damage. Fractionation, that is reducing the dose into number of fractions, um, helps reduce toxicity. But you'll get fatty marrow if your radiation dose is, is in, it's inevitable if the radiation dose is over 30 gray. So this is another sagittal T2 weighted image. It's not stir because there's no fat suppression, but you can see the normal vertebra here and the fatty vertebra up here due to radiotherapy. Post-radiation effects. The epiphysis is most sensitive, permanent changes above 1200 centigrade. Within one to two months, you've got growth plate widening, and soon after that, you'll get fatty marrow change. And the location of the bone irradiated affects how it grows subsequently. So you get bowing irregularity if the metaphysis or, or the growth plates are involved and you get more over tubulation with periosteal damage. Here's an adolescent with um, abnormal marrow, must have had metastatic disease and a lump, a Ewing sarcoma with an intraspinal and paraspinal lump. Um, radiotherapy caused fatty marrow changes initially, but then the child, due to the radiotherapy, went on to have in-plate changes, which are another known consequence of radiotherapy. Here are the plain radiograph findings of this, these MRI changes, all due to radiotherapy. You get a rickets-like appearance from radiation. You get metaphyseal fraying, physeal widening, usually occurs within a year, a year and um, it may result in leg length discrepancy, so a shorter leg, for instance. So this is the style that's been operated upon, the, or, and you get the physeal widening due to the radiotherapy. You can also get physeal widening evident on MR, and physeal widening is now recon recognized to occur with some of the targeted um, cancer agents, such as bevacizumide, or so-called Avastin, and some of the other agents also give you this physeal widening. So to show you a few cases, this is a child age two with vertebra plana. Here's the abnormal vertebra. Um, is this Langerhans cell histiocytosis or ALL, acute leukemia? Well, the marrow elsewhere looks normal. There's no other marrow changes. So we did the bone, they did bloods. Mar the marrow was normal on imaging, was marrow on sampling, and a skeletal survey. So everything points to us this being LCH, and it was Langerhans cell histiocytosis on biopsy. MRI is very good for diagnosing osteomyelitis, as you all know. The plain radiograph here looks normal, but on T1 image, there's something wrong with the marrow back there. It's a bit of edematous on the STIR sequence. And then on a fat suppressed T1 plus gadolinium enhancement, you can see the abnormal marrow enhancing. And that was that was straightforward case of osteomyelitis. Just to, osteomyelitis occurs in the metaphysis typically in children. Um, the growth plate vessels are open, the vice seal vessels are open until 12 to 18 months of age. So children to 12 to 18 months of age, if they get metaphyseal infections, can get epiphyseal infections and septic arthritis quite easily. But after 18 months of age, they just get metaphyseal infections until the growth plates fuse uh, when they're young or when they're adolescents, in which case their the risk of septic arthritis increases again. Discitis is another inflammatory disorder in the spine. If you rule out an epidural, there's, an, there's a big spectrum of disease from acute infective spondylitis, oh, I'm, I'm getting a bit late, uh, due to bacterial infections to uh, discitis in children. And, and as long as you rule out epidural paravertebral mass, um, 
The discitis can be managed symptomatically and it doesn't need a biopsy. CRMO, we've heard mentioned, you see patchy marrow changes uh, throughout the skeleton. MR is very useful for picking that up. Um, another case, pain in the child with metadonoblastoma, heel pain, edema on a, on a fat suppressed image, and this was a bone bruise. It's useful in trauma, but I won't go into the trauma. And finally, venous malformations. Um, ultrasound is very useful for seeing the presence of flow in venous malformations in children. They sometimes get flebolites. They get flebolites or thrombus on MR and fluid fluid levels. What people don't often realize is they get, they get involvement in the marrow too, quite commonly. And they can get involvement. This is a diffuse venous malformation in the subcutaneous tissues, but there's also involvement of the epiphysis and the joint, and they get joint destructions. And they can get joint destruction from recurrent hemarthrosis if the venous malformation involves the marrow. And I'm told that that's a commoner cause of joint destruction from hemarthrosis now than is hemophilia. Procedures can also do it. So this child had a renal tumor, and we saw some high signal here and here, and said, that's abnormal. But it's probably a Wilms tumor, so why? We shouldn't get bony metastases, and this child had a very difficult marrow aspirate. So, in conclusion, the, your normal marrow is a dynamic tissue. Systemic disorders affect it. Age-related conversion is important. T1 and STIR images, by and large, can sort out all your issues. I think if you do a lot of MRI, you can use any other sequences, and they'll, you'll get to know it. But if you don't use a lot of MRI, stick to your T1 and T2 images. And I just want to finish with a quote from one of those papers. In their young patients, in this age group, normal marrow may demonstrate increased T2 signal. It may enhance after gadolinium have restricted diffusion and show no loss of signal in out-of-phase imaging, all of which are MR characteristics usually associated with the disease. So in other words, if you stick to T1 and T2 imaging, you'll usually get it right. Thanks very much.